This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Configure and deploy a consortium blockchain network in just a few clicks with pre-built configurations and enterprise-grade infrastructure. Spend less time on blockchain scaffolding and more time building your application. To learn more, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, and welcome to Epicenter. My name is Brian Crane. Today, I'm going to speak with Justin Drake. He's a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. We had a super interesting conversation about the you know, future of Ethereum. There's, there was a lot of unclear things in my mind before this conversation, unfortunately, was able to clarify a lot, and I hope you will enjoy it as well. So yeah, please enjoy the conversation. Hi, I'm here today with Justin Drake. Justin is a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. I actually met Justin uh, a few years ago. He was back then, he was working, he was sort of a fellow at Anthemis. Uh, and there was this Anthemis retreat somewhere in the Alps in France. It was very gorgeous. And and he was there and, you know, we spent quite a bit of talking, a time talking there. He was working at a different uh, project then that was building an open bazaar. So I've known him for quite a while, but recently he's become very involved uh, in the Ethereum space and working on some of the cutting edge Ethereum work uh, to scale and, you know, kind of build the, the new, better Ethereum that will hopefully live up to its original promise of being this this world computer. So thanks so much for joining us today, Justin. Thank you for having me. So I'm curious, how did you originally become involved in in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space? Right, so I discovered uh, Bitcoin um, in 2013. And, um, you know, in mid-2013, I didn't really understand what was going on, but for some reason, it had this appeal to me. Um, and towards uh, late 2013, I uh, decided I was going to read the white paper. I printed it out. And, you know, it took me maybe 10 readings to actually understand what was going on. But because it's a short paper, I read it uh, several times. And... You know, just the intersection of things, of, you know, mathematics, which I studied at university, and uh, cryptography, and finance, and computer science, and networking, all these things came together. Um, and so in, uh, you know, just a few days after, you know, understanding it, um, you know, at a high level, I created the Bitcoin Meetup Group uh, in Cambridge, UK. Um, and then, you know, a few a few years later, I basically... Uh, decided to to quit my job and work uh, work full time um, on in the blockchain space. So I was a a, a programmer. Um, part of my time was um, programming FPGAs, and um, you know I was spending all my free time on Bitcoin, and it was just becoming unsustainable. So I was I started looking for an opportunity to uh, work full time in the in the blockchain space, and I found this uh, uh, program from Anthemis. Anthemis is a, is a venture fund in, in London, and they were offering basically no strings attached, a little bit of money to do research for one year uh, on the blockchain space. So I, I, I jumped on this opportunity, and during that time, I uh, created a, a company called uh, Duo, and as you mentioned, it was uh, building infrastructure on top of OpenBazaar. So why did you decide to build uh, something on top of Open Bazaar? So back then I was um, taking a user-centric point of view and I was trying to understand, okay, how can this be useful to people? And, you know, I realized that there was a, a lot of complexity and uh, that this complexity had to be abstracted somewhere. And this kind of appealed to me, you know, the idea of building a, a front-end, a UX which was totally minimal and abstracted as much as possible, um, you know, to the extent that you don't even realize that you're using Bitcoin or some other uh, technology. And back in the day, uh, Open Bazaar was the, the most promising actual use case of uh, of Bitcoin. You know, we were talking about uh, remittances and uh, you know getting discounts on Purse.io, but you know these things didn't really appeal to me. And then uh, Open Bazaar, this idea of uh, peer-to-peer decentralized marketplace, was like a a fascinating vision, and uh, I wanted to help out by building infrastructure on top of it to make it easy for people to use Open Bazaar. So, when you started working on Open Bazaar, Ethereum was already around. 
So why didn't you decide at that time to say, okay, I want to build something on Ethereum? Why did, were you, you know, did you feel more committed to Bitcoin or maybe more in line with Bitcoin's vision as opposed to Ethereum's? So Ethereum was almost uh, nothing back then. Um, it was it was an idea, it was a team, but it was extremely ambitious. And I had some doubts as to whether or not the developers would actually pull it off. But uh, for sure, it's an idea that uh, appealed to me and I followed it uh, very closely. The more Ethereum developed, the more I realized, you know, this is the right answer. And within the Open Bazaar community, I, you know, lobbied in a way for, you know, more than just uh, Bitcoin support. You know, in particular, I wanted to have Ethereum support, but it was it was difficult. I'd say that, you know, they were almost Bitcoin maximalist, and they, you know, they've gradually been been uh, softening their stance. You know, they've added more coin, they, and and now you know they're, they're at a point where they're looking to integrate uh, Ethereum. But, um, yeah, it, it, that, I guess that's part of the reason why I, I left Open Bazaar. But I think the the main reason why I left Open Bazaar is because it I felt it was a bit too early. So in order to build a decentralized peer to peer marketplace, you need all this infrastructure, right? You need um, a scalable blockchain to start with, but also you need uh, identity, reputation, dispute resolution, uh, stable coins, uh, all all these things that are basically going to take years to build. And Open Bazaar is about mashing together all these components and making a, a nice user experience, but we don't really have the foundations. Absolutely, because that's that's one of the interesting things that like stands out to me here is you know first you go and you work on a company that's trying to build like you know a slick end user application, tries to be you know make all of the you know abstract all of this complex technology, make it like easy and user friendly. And then you go to like the absolute polar opposite and work on like Ethereum research and like as far removed from like user experience and interface as possible. So that's that's quite a you know it's quite a quite a shift you made. Yeah, I mean in in 2013 and 2014, I was drinking the Kool Aid. I was you know and had these grand visions of of you know how society would be reshaped, and um, you know part of it you know, was that, that there was this uh, this belief that, uh, you know, Bitcoin would actually scale and would be the platform for, for all these things. But, you know, as, as we learned more and more, you know, Bitcoin took a very conservative stance and didn't change. And I think that led to the frustrating of people like myself who were, you know, almost Bitcoin maximalist in the sense that I believe Bitcoin was... Uh, was the answer to basically uh, flip flopping and, and and leaving Bitcoin? Um, in terms of you know going to the polar extreme uh, at the consensus layer, I guess you know I learned a hard lesson that we are still very early and you know fundamental problems like scalability need to be addressed, um, and so maybe we should address these first before uh, thinking of the application layer. But do you feel tempted that you know once maybe in two years or three years when there's lots of progress being made, do you want to go back to building like end user applications? I think that that, that might be an option. Um, it will take a few years for the full Ethereum 2.0 vision to be fully rolled out. But once it's mature, I expect Ethereum 2.0 to you know not require so much maintenance and so much change. And it might make sense to for me to build something at the application layer um, or the service layer, because I was if effectively a, a, on top of the application layer, the service layer, I was building front ends and, you know, a search engine. And uh, we implemented the OpenBazaar client in JavaScript as a uh, you know, decentralized uh, node that, that would run in the browser. So this is kind of infrastructure that is not really the smart contract layer, but the one layer above. So now let's switch to Ethereum. And and Ethereum is, is interesting because, you know, when, when the Ethereum white paper came out back in 2014, there was already, you know, talk about switching to proof of stake. And there was you know, some of these long-term ideas for sharding and scaling. But I think at the time, because they were maybe very abstract, uh, people could still have at least, uh, at least this 
subjective sense that they have some idea about where things are going and, and what things look like. But then over time, what we've seen in the last year is just explosion in complexity. And now there, so just to list some of the things that are being worked on, right? So there's Casper, and then there's this Casper FFG, right? There's fast finality gadgets, there's Casper CBC, then there's Plasma. Now, there seems to be a lot of different Plasma implementation, including Plasma Cache. And there's sort of tremendous a variety of activity there. Then there's the whole sharding. And I guess you mentioned that Vlad is working on some sort of sharding correct by construction. So maybe there's different sharding directions. Then, and this is something we're going to speak later quite a bit, there's this beacon chain work. Then there's the work on using maybe PLS and threshold signatures. There is work on verifiable delay functions and maybe having like a ASIC, Ethereum specific ASIC, which is very different from the proof of work ASICs. Then uh, the work on eWASM. So I think, I, you know, it has be, be come to the point where it's, I think, really, really hard for people to have a sense of where are things going, where are they at, and what's Ethereum going to look like in the future. So what's your take on it? Is this great because there's so much activity? Is it that maybe it's too scattered and maybe not focused enough? Or like, how would you describe at this moment kind of the the work on Ethereum 2.0? Right. So, I mean, you talk about complexity in general in the whole space. And I'd say that a lot of the uh, the research was driven by the need for scalability. And scalability really is a non-trivial thing. So, you know, you mentioned Plasma and all the variants of Plasma. That's a layer of complexity, which is a layer, layer two. And then there's a research happening at, at layer one with things like, like Casper and sharding. I'd say a lot of the complexity is you know, finding the right way towards, you know, the optimal uh, way forward. But a lot of the the, the, the research and the new ideas that uh, have come out have uh, settled down towards a really, really nice vision, which actually is uh, simple and, and, and can be explained uh, and, and implemented with, with relative ease. I'd say a lot of the complexity has been... Um, modularized in, in you know, what I'd like to call gadgets. So for example, uh, the finality, Casper FFG, you, know, you can think of that as just one module. You, know, you can go into the details if you're interested, but you can also think of it abstractly as just like a finality gadget. And you know, we have all these, various finality, uh, all these various gadgets, and they all fit in quite nicely in the Ethereum 2.0 vision. And then in terms of roadmap, we've segmented things um, into three layers. And it's not just in terms of roadmap, but also in terms of modularity. So the, the layer zero um, is basically just the beacon chain, which is this uh, piece of system infrastructure, which uh, manages the rest of the system. Um, and it provides services, for example, such as randomness, um, the management of the validators. It provides finality and various other things. And it's where most of the complexity lies. And then we have uh, phase one or layer one, which is the, the data layer. So if you think of a blockchain, you have two things going on. One, you have a consensus game, people agreeing as to what data is being fed into the blockchain. Uh, and that would be uh, layer one for us. And then we have layer two, which is the uh, execution of the transactions, basically giving meaning to that data running it through an EVM and having a notion of state. And so we have this progressive roadmap where we're focusing on, on layer zero and then layer one and then layer two. Maybe one thing that would help people wrap their head a, a little bit around, um, you know, around what you're talking about in, in the, these different components and the roadmap is if we, let's look at the sort of a little bit towards the end state. Let's assume all of these things actually get built out and they work and we now have this upgraded Ethereum that's kind of capable of, of delivering all the promises made or the expectations set. What does that look like in terms of, you know, what are the main components? How do they interact? But also, what does it look like from a user experience perspective? Right. So in terms of the, the main goals of Ethereum 2.0, number one is to move away from proof of work onto proof of stake. 
Um, and that's partly, you know, to uh, reduce the cost of proof of work, but also to enable new things. You know, for example, we're enabling finality and we're enabling sharding by having a proof of stake. And then the second aspect is scalability with sharding. And the idea here is that instead of having one single blockchain, you have 1,024 blockchains. So you have roughly on the order of magnitude of 1,000x uh, increase in scalability. Um, so from the point of view of the application developer, you can choose a shard and have your app, your dApp, live in that shard. Um, and it will have a virtual machine, somewhat similar to the uh, virtual machine in Ethereum 1.0, except that the virtual machine will be based on, on WebAssembly. In terms of um, the good news is that you'll have this upgraded virtual machine and you'll also have uh, more scalability and hence lower fees. The bad news is that you'll have to, um, complexity in terms of the cross-shard communication. And another thing we want to introduce is the notion of sustainable storage or storage rent or storage maintenance fees. And the idea here is to uh, set things up uh, from an incentive standpoint so that the state doesn't keep growing eternally. Um, and so as a uh, application developer, you will have to take that into account, which might make your life a bit more difficult. You mentioned there's going to be all of these different shards. As an application developer, I mean, is this going to be a kind of similar thing to maybe a Cosmos zone or Polkadot relay chain in that, you know, there may be different, uh, no, not a relay chain, a parachain, that there may be different blockchains that there may be for there's a bunch of game related shards and other shards, or does it, is that all abstracted away and I don't care and this just provides scalability? Right. So um, I'd say FM 2.0 is very similar to Polkadot. So we have this notion of a central chain, which we call the beacon chain, they call the relay chain, and we have uh, shards when they have uh, parachains. The main difference is that uh, we are going towards a homogeneous uh, shards. So every blockchain at the consensus layer is exactly the same. Uh, and that, from an implementation standpoint, just makes a whole load of simplifications. So even though from a uh, theoretical standpoint, it might be slightly less powerful, it means that you have a, a simpler and potentially more robust system. Yeah, and then my other question was, will I, as an application developer, will I choose particular shards because they differ in some way, maybe on the type of applications that are also on that shard or in, in some other ways, or, or is this something that I don't care about? Right, so you would probably choose your shard based on... Um, uh, gas costs. So every shard will have its own uh, gas market, which is another complexity. Um, and so, you know, you want to choose the shard with the, the lowest fees, but at the same time, you want to choose a shard based on uh, proximity to other applications. So within each shard, things should happen quite fast and, and quite cheaply. You want to try and avoid the cross shard communications. There is the proof of work chain as well, right? Where today the ether lives and the application live. And now in the future, of course, we, ha we expect that uh, the decentralized applications will run on these shards. So what is going to happen with the, the main, the, today's Ethereum proof of work chain? Right. So we use the Ethereum 1.0 uh, chain, the proof of work chain, basically for bootstrapping, for economic bootstrapping. So we already have this this you know, billions of dollars in tokens, and we use that to bootstrap the uh, Ethereum 2.0 uh, system. And, you know, one of the main questions that it asks is, is the Ethereum 2.0 ETH going to be the same as the 1.0 ETH? And yes, it's the same, and we're using the same precisely to have this bootstrapping mechanism. And so down the line, the proof-of-work chain would then at some point be shut down? Right. So we don't really know exactly what we're going to do with the proof-of-work chain. Um, most likely, in my opinion, is that it's going to stay alive in some way or another for many years to come. Um, one option is to integrate it as uh, you know, a contract within one of the shards. Uh, but that's quite a, an ambitious vision. It's possible that it, it will just live there for some time. Another option is to have 
some sort of a bomb that you know gradually will will mean that applications will have to move away. So you can imagine, for example, a um, a gas price bomb or a gas limit bomb. You know, over time the gas limit goes to zero, or over time the gas price goes to infinity. And then the, the tokens, will it be possible to move ETH from the proof of work chain to the shards and, and also back? It's a, a unidirectional thing. So um, you take the ETH in the 1.0, uh, for example, 32 ETH, you deposit that into the beacon chain, and that um, makes you a validator. Um, once they're in the beacon chain, you can withdraw them in the shards. And then between the shards and the beacon chain, you can do whatever you want. Oh, that's interesting. So you basically burn your like old ETH and you receive then new ETH on the on the beacon chain. Exactly. And so when the beacon chain, I, I guess that's maybe a time to speak a bit more about the, the beacon chain in detail. Two things I understand, right, is uh, one is that it keeps track of the validators, right? So the validators both on the beacon chain, but also on all the shards. And it has this process of, you know, selecting the validators for the different shards and, and kind of the set of validators. And I think that's what we're going to speak a lot more about later, because uh, I think that, that, you know, that's a key part of your work. And is there also, does it also keep track, for example, on all... Uh, of, of balances of ether or will those be in in the different shards right so it keeps track of balances of ether for the validators the validators being the key uh, consensus participants in ethereum 2.0 and you know it does uh, grunt work for example handling the deposits and the rewards and the penalties and the withdrawals and all these things as i mentioned it also basically provides infrastructure for the shards and, and for, for the system. So it provides randomness. Randomness is important because uh, we will be sampling validators to perform various tasks. So we'll say, okay, this validator will have to propose blocks on shards you know, X, Y, and Z. And you know, this set of, of validators as a committee will have to uh, do uh, attestation or notarization on, on, on this specific shard. So the way that we achieve scaling is basically by giving different validators different tasks spread out across all the shards. It's very much it's very different from the current model where everyone's working on the same shard in this massively replicated fashion. And so we, we're making these uh, gr smaller groups of validators be large enough that they are statistically representative of the wider pool of validators, but they're still quite small. And then is there also a, a, a kind of a rotation of the validator set so that, you know, a particular shard will have some validators for some time, but then as, as a validator, I continually will work on different shards? Yeah, so in general, you want to have as much rotation as possible, and that's to uh, prevent what I call adaptive attacks. So once you know who, who is assigned to which shard, you can try and bribe them or you can try and DDoS them or try and do, do bad things. So the more you shuffle them, the, the greater the security. And um, we have different types of committees. So we have one type of committee, which uh, is for notarization. It's basically to solve the, the data availability problem. And basically you're asking validators, is this uh, piece of data available to download and, or is it not? And if enough people say that it is available to download, then given your honesty assumption, then uh, the data is indeed uh, available to download. But there are things which uh, are, are more difficult and you can't do the, the shuffling so fast. And that, for example, is uh, the, the, application, the, the state layer, uh, the execution layer. So when you want to execute a transaction, you need to have access to the relevant state. And Downloading that state will take time. You need to sync up. And so you can only shuffle so fast. We are looking into a very interesting approach called stateless clients. So in stateless clients, basically users come with their own state. They include the state in the transactions directly, and they include witnesses, which are basically proofs that the state corresponds to the state root, which is the, the master checkpoint. Um, and that would mean that the, uh, the the executors, those who are executing the transactions, do not have 
the, you do not need to have the states, and so they can be rotated uh, maximally fast. Okay, great. That's no, this is helping a lot. I think in in wrapping my head around a little bit. If you've listened to previous episodes with Marley Gray and Matt Kerner, you know that Microsoft is committed to providing enterprise-grade tools and infrastructure for blockchain developers. Well, the Azure Blockchain Workbench is perfect for organizations building consortium networks. Take the Ethereum Proof of Authority template, for example. It's ideal for permission networks where consensus participants are known and reputable. Ethereum on Azure has on-chain network governance that leverages Parity's extensible Proof of Authority client. Each consortium member has the power to govern the network or delegate their consensus participants to a trusted operator. And Parity's WebAssembly support allows developers to write smart contracts in familiar languages like C, C++, and Rust. Azure Blockchain Workbench was created on the same principles that drive all production services in Azure, so you know you're relying on secure, redundant infrastructure that can scale. And with built-in services like authenticated APIs, off-chain databases, and secure key management services, you can scaffold your infrastructure in just a few hours. To learn more about Azure Blockchain Workbench and how Microsoft is advancing blockchain usability in enterprise, check out aka.ms slash epicenter and start building today. We'd like to thank Microsoft Azure for their support of Epicenter. You mentioned that this is unidirectional, right? So we, we move the Ether from the main chain and I can now deposit it in a contract and I get this right to validate. Does that mean, is there token transfer on the, on the beacon chain though? Because in, in the initial phase, right, there is just a beacon chain and shards don't exist yet. So does that mean if, if I'm moving my Ether now to, to stake on the shard, I'm essentially locking it up until the shards become live and only at that point I'm starting to be able to transfer them? Or, or can you? Yeah, that is correct. So in the initial phases when we don't have the shards, you need to kind of be a believer and want to be a validator for, for a reasonably long amount of time. Um, you cannot transfer the uh, the tokens to other people within the shards. It's not an application layer thing. It's not a user thing. It's purely a system thing, and we only have system infrastructure. And in particular, there's no smart contracts. It's all extremely simple. Um, where you would use your ETH and, and do all the transactions and, and contracts would be in the shards, and so you'd have to wait for, for, for that to happen. And that would only happen in phase two when you actually have... Uh, the shards have a notion of state. Uh, in phase one, we would have the shards, so we would have blocks and, and and each shard would be growing over time and there would be consensus as to what uh, what the data is, but you wouldn't be able to use your ETH. Okay, interesting. So that, that will require kind of like a big leap and I, I guess potentially will mean that lots of ether would get locked up for, you know, I guess it sounds like it could be a long time, you know? Exactly, yes. Um, I mean, we are hoping for uh, hundreds of thousands of validators uh, eventually. So each validator needs to come in with 32 ETH. Um, but I think the, the minimum uh, number of validators that we will require to uh, start the process will be on the order of 10,000 validators. I mean, maybe a detailed question, but uh, I guess will there be some sort of like higher reward if there's fewer validators so that there is an incentivization to move early? Or... Exactly, yes. Um, so the more people there are, the smaller the rewards. And so if there's only 10,000 validators, there will be a huge incentive uh, to, to, to be a validator. You can check the, the specific curve. It's basically a, a quadratic curve. Um, so it's not, it's not you know, it's exactly linear. There's a, there's a different curve that was chosen. So you mentioned the, the Polkadot relay chain before. And of course, one of the functions of the relay chain, besides, um, at least the way I understand it, besides looking out for the security, is that it also has this interoperability function. Or, you know, in the Cosmos as well, if, if he, even though the security and, and validation layer works very differently there, but you have the Cosmos hub, right, that you can set, basically use to... Uh, you know, keep track of like token balances and stuff like that. So, uh, how does the this cross chart com cross chart communication uh, work here? Is there or does the beacon chain have a function in terms of supporting interoperability between shards? Yes, absolutely. So, one of the key things of the beacon chain is to allow the various shards to communicate with each other, and the uh, 
one of the processes that we have here is the notion of a crosslink. So um, periodically within every shard, um, there will be checkpoints which will be included in the beacon chain. Um, and then these checkpoints, which we call crosslinks, uh, will, will be used for other shards to be able to uh, read the state uh, on every other shard. So basically, you can think of the beacon chain as being a light client for every single shard. In terms of additional infrastructure that we have for cross-shard communication, number one is we have finality. So um, once you have a crosslink which is finalized, that's like a super strong crosslink, and it should never revert. And so you can really rely upon that uh, at the at the application layer when you want to communicate with other shards. We also have um, some sort of notion of pre-finality. So within each shard, we have so-called attestations, which are votes from uh, other validators on the block. So every time a block is created, you have a bunch of validators who are invited to uh, vote as to whether or not that block is building on top of the tip. So basically building on top of the parent, which was kind of on the canonical chain. Um, and if a block gets uh, sufficiently many of these attestations, then with very high probability, that block is going to eventually be finalized, even though the crosslink right now hasn't been included in the beacon chain and the beacon chain has not been finalized. So basically we have this spectrum of finality where it starts with a, a beacon proposer building a block and then you have these attestations coming in and then you have the, the, the notaries coming in, creating a crosslink which gets included in the beacon chain and then the beacon chain gets finalized through the Casper FFG process. Cool. At the, so recently there was the Web3 Summit in, uh, in Berlin and Gavin gave a, a talk and a demo about, uh, about Substrate and, and Polkadot. And uh, I thought Dennis from A16C, he asked this really good question, which was basically about the, you know, the composability of Polkadot versus Ethereum. And he made this point that you know, today on Ethereum, it's, it's really nice in that you can, you can write this application and it uses you know, maybe Maker as a stable coin and uses like Dharma and prediction markets and you know, lots of different things. And it's very easy to write this application. And you know, basically ask Gavin, I mean, okay, how is that going to work in in the Polkadot model? And you know, Polkadot initially talked about having cross chain smart contract calls, but Gavin basically made the point, and I hope I'm you know not misquoting him here, but that, you know, even though that's you know that's in the works, but that it's going to take a long time to make this you know, even semi feasible. And that, you know, in the meantime, it, it will actually be much better to build things like that on Ethereum, you know, where you have a lot of, uh, you're basically on a single chain. So I'm, I'm curious about this point of composability and, you know, the ability to write applications that, you know, like use lots of different contracts. Do you have a sense of how that will differ in terms of the difficulty between, you know, maybe the future Ethereum and something like Polkadot? So right, right now in Ethereum 1.0, everything is interoperable. So if you have two, two smart contracts, they're basically on the same chain. And when you make a call, it's a synchronous call. So, it, um, so that's relatively uh, easy to reason about. In the, in the 2.0, um, we want to you know, maximize the network effect. So we want all the shards to be part of this one organism, which is uh, coherent. Uh, but there are boundaries between the shards. and so. The question is, how do we make these boundaries um, as, as small as possible and reduce the friction? And part of the story here is at the consensus layer, the protocol layer, adding infrastructure to make it easy for the various shards to communicate. So I mentioned these crosslinks. The crosslinks allow for asynchronous communication between the shards, which is different from the synchronous communication that you're used to uh, with, you know, within the Ethereum uh, 1.0 context. Um, but we're also adding, you know, this this notion of attestation, this pre-finality, and you can use that at the uh, layer two um, uh, layer. Basically, you can have uh, optimistic cross-shard communication protocols. So, with high probability in the default case, 
uh, things will happen um, as you'd expect, even if you haven't gone through this whole process of finality. And so you can use that to your advantage to have very short uh, cross shard communication protocols. One of the things that I expect will happen is a standardization in the um, cross shard communication protocols, something very similar to what has happened with the standardization of, of uh, tokens, for example, with ERC20, Ethereum 2.0. Um, application layer will be a uh, state layer will be you know very universal and very generic so you can build whatever type of communication you want um, and you know that makes it a bit more complicated because uh, you have to make a choice but I think the the, the best designs will be uh, experimented upon and they will be standardized okay okay I, I guess that maybe reminds me a little bit of you know, let, let's say the work that Interledger has done, you know, if the Interledger protocol, which is also kind of like, you know, a higher level chain agnostic. And, you know, recently we did a podcast with Stefan Tomas, and we also talked a little bit about their assumption that actually the Interledger protocol, it will mostly function between layer two solutions, right? So like a Lightning and the Raiden and stuff like that. And in between there is, will be the Interledger. So do you... I guess it goes a little bit in this direction too. You know that like many people could come up with some sort of like standard interface between the different shards and then there will be kind of like a competition and maybe a standardization effort and at some point maybe people will converge on some uh, some standard. Right. I think there will be lots of experimentation and some standardization uh, at the application layer. I also think, you know, we can make upgrades uh, and add infrastructure as required. So one of the pieces of infrastructure that I'd like to see, for example, is, um, you know, synchronous, maybe cross shard uh, transactions, just of pure ETH. So we're taking a very specific use case, just the transactions of ETH and, you know, kind of adding native infrastructure for that. You know, we might um, take the best designs at the uh, layer two um, and the most popular ones and enshrine them. So basically include them at the at the protocol layer, maybe to simplify them in some way or to give them a, a special uh, feature. The, the way that I think, you know, uh, of Ethereum 2.0 is as this, this base layer, which is actually very simple. And then you have all these gadgets which add functionality. So, you know, finality is, is just a gadget. You don't really require it. It's nice to have because it makes the communication uh, cross chain uh, simpler, and also you have uh, you have more confidence in the chain that that you know when it when it progresses. And I think we will add more and more things uh, going forward. So we will make sure that the uh, EVM is aware of components that are added at the protocol layer. Let's now say that in this future, I'm going to EtherScan. And I have an address and I want to see how many Ether are in, in this address. Then what does Etherscan do on the back end? Like, does my Ether live in a particular shard? And now there has to be some sense of, oh, which shard do I need to query to see the balance? Or like, how would that work? Yeah, so I think most likely um, the address will contain the, the shard number in addition to what we know as the address right now. Uh, just be the concatenation of these two fields, and you just paste that into EtherScan, and it will be the same user experience that you're used to. Okay, okay, great. Well, we've alluded to it before, but let's dive into this now. So the the question about randomness, like what is, what's the reason f for uh, needing randomness in the Ethereum 2.0? Right, so... Uh, at the uh, consensus layer, you need randomness to sample the validators. So you have this massive pool of validators, potentially you know, close to a million validators, and you want to assign them different tasks. And it's important from a security perspective that it be random because you know, otherwise, as an attacker, you can try and uh, you know, assign yourself to one specific shard and take over that shard, for example. And so... The two types of sampling that we do is one, which is kind of monopolistic sampling, where you just sample one single person and you give them a task and they have monopoly power over that single task. And we use that, for example, for block proposals. So at every single uh, so-called slot, 
there's one single proposer uh, per shard who is invited to extend uh, the that, that specific shard. But you also have these committees. So committees are you know on the order of, of hundreds of validators, and they're meant to be uh, large enough to be statistically representative of the of the wider pool. Um, and because you have this honesty assumption, so for example, you're assuming that, that two thirds of the validators are honest. When you do the sampling process, the committee, you know with extremely high probability that at least half of them are honest. And so you can ask them to do a task and, and vote. And if at least half of them vote uh, for something, then you know that there's at least one honest person who's voted. And so whatever they're voting on is indeed a reflecting of the truth. I would say let's come back to the the role of con- of how specifically randomness is used in in the validator sampling and and how you use verifiable delay functions. But I would love to also hear your take a bit on you know what is the value of having randomness as a you know as a, as something you can make an API call to right? Like I'm I'm building an application and I can now say hey. Give me some randomness, and I use that to, you know, make some decision, or you know, split some fork, or maybe distribute some money, or you know, do a lottery. So I think the lottery example is something that you know is kind of obvious to anybody, right? So we could we could make a a smart contract. We all put some money in, and then you know, randomly chooses maybe one uh, out of everyone who put the money in, you know, according to you know how much they put in, right? So you could make this trustlessly centralized lottery, which you know, it sounds pretty great, but what are some what are some other exciting applications that you think will be possible with having this randomness source? Right. So let me just uh, go go back to, to to the randomness because in a way we already have randomness with proof of work. Right. Proof of work is about randomly uh, sampling uh, a miner, and um, you have a random number which is going to be your 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 block hash. And you know that is something that we already expose in the Ethereum 1.0 uh, layer uh, as an opcode that you can use. One of the things that you need to be very careful of is that the this block hash is is biasable, meaning that an attacker, if they want to, can have some amount of influence over what that random number will be. And the way that they do that as a miner is that they will withhold their block and not uh, broadcast it if the block that they've mined has a random number that they don't like. They basically discard it. And a lot of the uh, decentralized randomness schemes suffer from this uh, bias problem. And so, you know, we've put a lot of effort in trying to build something that is unbiasable, uh, similar to what Definity is doing, uh, where they have a, an unbiasable random number scheme using, using BLS signatures. Now, why is unbiasability important? Let me take the example of the lottery. Let's say that um, an attacker has one single bit of bias, meaning that um, they can choose between two random numbers at any given point in time. For example, when the lottery winner is selected. Now, if you have a lottery with $100 million and you as an attacker, uh, you come in with another $100 million, so there's $200 million in the pot. If you had no bias, you would be, you, you know, your probability of winning would be one half. And so your expected return would be 100 million. But now that you have one bit of bias, you can re-roll the die once. And so you can choose between uh, two, two numbers. And so your probability of winning now is three quarters. And so you've basically stolen 50 million uh, from the community just be, by being able to bias the randomness. And so um, just in general, gambling, casinos, and all these things are... are are obvious applications. So in terms of applications beyond lottery, you have uh, all the, the various gambling applications like uh, uh, casinos and, and, and poker rooms, but you also have uh, games, you know, such as CryptoKitties. And there's also applications in um, proof systems. So if you have a zero-knowledge proof, for example, a stock, you can uh, decompose it into, into smaller chunks where you have this interactive protocol. You have a, a you know, a prover uh, who, who's, who's challenging some, uh, who's being challenged, and here you you need to have a strong randomness for the security to work. Um, you can also think of systems which 
uh, again, have a pool of validators and you sample them. And so you can uh, use that to build um, you know, proof of stake systems on top of Ethereum. And so with somebody like BLS, right? you mentioned Definity and you know, for a listener who's interested in that, we, we did a podcast with Tom and Dominic before where we also talked about you know, BLS and, and, and their role there. Does that qualify as unbiasable? Yes. So um, the way that their scheme works, I mean, BLS is just a technicality, is um, that you have various participants who have um, a share of a secret. And if uh, sufficiently many uh, people come together, um, specifically you need to reach a certain threshold, then you can generate the next, the next number. And you need at least th this amount of people to generate the next number. And the next number is totally unique and, and deterministic. Um, and it's impossible for someone to predict uh, the next random number if they don't have uh, the share. And it's impossible to, to bias because there's just a single correct answer as to what the next random number will be. Right. So, so in Definity, right, specifically, let's say we have 500 uh, kind of nodes in this set. And then if more than 50%, I mean, you know, 250, I guess, right, come together, they can create the next key. Uh, but which of those 250 come together is irrelevant, right? Like any anyone, you get the same result, but you need to get those 250 in order to get that result. Right. I mean, you do want to um, have a well-defined committee because if you have, so let's say, two different committees, that are each invited to create the next random number, then you can uh, grind between the two. You know, one will come first or something like that. So you, yeah, you do want to have uh, on, on ambiguity on, on who will be doing the, the task. The main problem with the Definity scheme is what happens if you don't reach the threshold of uh, active participants, people who are online and honest. And one, this is a problem because people could be dishonest and, you know, actively decide to not participate. And Definity is already making an assumption that one third of the people are going to be dishonest. But the other problem is that in the honest people, you know, they could just be offline for all sorts of reasons. And one of the design goals that we have in Ethereum is to survive World War III. So if, you know, 80% of all the validators suddenly go offline and they stay offline permanently, you know, we still want the system to go ahead. In the case of Definity, it takes just 10 or 15% of the honest players to go offline for the liveness of the system to be threatened. So it's 10 or 15%, but wouldn't they need just uh, around 50% of the, of the participant for, to produce the next signature? So Definity requires two-thirds to be honest and online. So there's two assumptions here. Honest and online. That already you've lost one third that are dishonest by assumption. And so you're only left with 66%. Of these 66%, if you have even a small fraction that are offline, let's say 10%, then you will eventually get a committee where you don't have this threshold of half that is on, honest and online. And with 10%, I think you will hit that you know, within a day or two. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Because ran because there will be different committees chosen, and uh, and then you you could get unlucky uh, in some way, I guess, if the committee isn't uh, if it's not a big enough number, and and then halt. Yeah, I mean, I I guess we'll see if these assumptions are so problematic, or if you couldn't then also do something like a hard fork in a kind of extreme scenario like that, and and you could still recover. Yeah, so you could try and do a hard fork, but you need to know who's online and who's offline. Because if you just, you know, restart and most people are still offline, then, you know, you'll just stall, you know, 10 minutes later. Um, so that's not useful. In terms of whether the assumption is that, you know, two thirds are honest and online is like a, a good one to make in, in the long term, that's very difficult to, to know. It's a bit like a, like a seatbelt, right? The seatbelt is only useful in the one instance where you have an accident. And that, you know, rarely happens in, in but when it does happen, you really want the seatbelt. Yeah, I mean, no, of course, nobody will argue that uh, things being equal, it's much preferable if the thing goes wrong and doesn't have this assumption. So that, that's, there's no question here. So let's speak about the 
uh, I guess the verifiable delay function and the role that this delay function has in you know in how randomness is created on this beacon chain. Right. So um, you have these two classical families of uh, randomness schemes. Um, one is based on commit reveal, and one is based on threshold cryptography. So commit reveal that includes the the proof of work because in a way you've you've committed yourself to a random number just by burning electricity, and then you have the option to either reveal it or not reveal it. And then there's uh, schemes which are you know based on proof of stake, which is uh, called Randall. So with Randall, you you just pick a secret on your computer, you commit to it by hashing it and publishing the hash. And then at some point in time, you're invited to reveal the secret. And that will contribute towards the entropy pool of, of the system. Um, and then you have this other scheme, which is based on, on official cryptography that uh, for, on, upon which uh, Definity is based. And in each of these two classes, you have two of three properties that you want. The three properties that you want is one, unpredictability. Two, you want uh, liveness. You want the scheme to continue even if people go offline. And three, you want unbiasability. The commit reveal doesn't have unbiasability, and the threshold scheme doesn't have strong liveness. And so the approach that we're taking is to take Randall, which is not unbiasable, but has this strong liveness property, and somehow upgrade it so that you have unbiasable random numbers. And this upgrade process involves introducing uh, the notion of time. So you want to try and introduce um, lower bounds on the amount of time before an attacker knows how he's manipulating the randomness so that he's basically manipulating things in the dark and uh, he will be unable to actually have a, a meaningful bias uh, on the randomness. So let, let me try, because I, I think I, I sort of wrapped my head around how this works now after you know we spoke briefly before and I watched your you know, your theorem talk. So let me try to explain it. Maybe you can correct me. So let's say now this, what we're doing, right, is like me and you, you know, the two of us, right, we together create a random number. Uh, you know, we, we make up this one period and, you know, you create this random number and you submit it and I create one and I submit it and then the two together create this, you know, random number. And now the issue is, if and and this is a there's a timeout here, right? So let's say you go first, I go second. If I, if I don't do it, then it's just yours that will be taken as the input for that. But now, if you just have that, right? Then uh, I'm second. I could I could check, you know, what number num, random number results, and then I could decide or not decide to add my bit, uh, and then you know bias the result. And now with this verifiable delay function, basically what we're doing is, let's say I have five seconds to add my bit to this, which will then generate the random number for a particular period. But the, to calculate actually what's the output, the random number resulting from our inputs, it takes longer than I have to submit my number, right? So I can, I can take yours and I could put in possible answers for my random bit. But to know how I will bias it, it will take me, let's say, a minute, but I only have five seconds to submit the random number. So now I don't have the chance anymore to bias, uh, to bias the, the random number. Yeah, that's exactly right. So instead of having just two participants, you want to have many more um, so that there's at least one which is uh, honest and online. Um, the honest participant will not reveal to the world what their secret is. Uh, and so that will create an element of unpredictability within the Randall epoch. Um, the Randall epoch, let's say, is, is it's uh, ten minutes, and you have a uh, hundred participants, one of which is honest. <clears throat> and then at the end of the epoch, what the Randall process does is basically it XORs all the revealed numbers from these hundred people, and the XOR is going to be again unpredictable because you have one person that is adding unpredictability to it. But the problem is that the last revealer, or the, those who are towards the end, it could be the last or the last two or the last three, et cetera, they have influence once they know what everyone else has revealed because it's an, it's an ordered list. And so to, to prevent this last revealer attack, you basically, add, exactly as you said, you add a minimum guaranteed delay 
between when you make the action and when you know the result of your action. And so even if you want to try and bias things, you won't have enough time to know what the action, uh, the result of your action will be, and hence you won't be able to bias. Yeah, and of course, if I'm able for some reason, right, if I have like some super quantum computer or something, and I can, I, let's say I, we have a thousand people who are revealing this random bit and I'm the last one, and let's say I had this like amazing supercomputer and I was able to do it within a split second, then I could still calculate, okay, you know, how would I influence this random number and then decide whether I, uh, I reveal it or not. So there, there's this hardware component that comes in here. Exactly. So um, if you have hardware which allows you to defeat the randomness, so the, the, defeat the guaranteed delay, which is enforced basically by doing computations. It takes time to do computations, and hence it, it takes time for you to compute the output of the VDF. F stands for function. It's just a function which returns an output. If you have this hardware, then basically you're falling back to Randall. So if it happens that you are the last revealer, then you will have one bit of attack surface. Now, in order to um, create this guaranteed delay, you basically need to have uh, an assumption about um, the speed of hardware of the honest people and the speed of the hardware of the dishonest people, the attacker. And specifically, you want to place a, a, a bound on how much faster an attacker can be. So let's say that your bound is 10x or 100x. So an attacker cannot be 100 times faster than the honest players. And if you have this bound of, let's say, 100x, then you can make your computation time be 100 times more than the guaranteed delay that you want. And so an attacker can only compress things down uh, to, by, by a factor of 100. And the way that we make sure that it's impossible for an attacker to have hardware which is 100 times faster than what the honest uh, people have is basically to give the honest people, the community at large, access to really fast hardware to start with. So the Ethereum Foundation is looking to build um, an ASIC, a state-of-the-art ASIC with a state-of-the-art circuits for compu co computing this, this VDF, and we're going to use an advanced node, and we're going to make as many optimizations as we can. Um, and after that, we're going to make the assumption that the attacker can't be that much faster than what we were, what we were um, capable of doing. And of course, the, the interesting thing here about doing this like ASIC is now, now let's say we have uh, this ASIC and it per performs at a, certain, at a certain performance. Now, if you compare this in Bitcoin with ASICs, I as a miner, I have a, if I can improve my, you know, performance, electricity consumption, hash throughput by, you know, 5%, that's great. I'm going to do it, right? I'm going to invest a lot of money in that because I can then earn more money and become more profitable. And, you know, which is how Bitmain became like a massive company. But here it's not really the same, right? So here my advantage only comes in if I'm able to like be orders of, you know, maybe an order of magnitude faster than the rest. Otherwise, like a kind of small improvement doesn't, doesn't really get me anything. Exactly. Small improvements gives you nothing, uh, so long as they're below this, this, this critical point. Um, and even after the critical point, if, even if you've somehow managed to, to reach that, you know, you're 100 times faster, then there's a, a graceful decay of the security. So let's say you're 101 times faster then you actually have almost no influence. You know, maybe one in a million times you'll be able to influence one bit. So you have this, this perfect unbiasability if you're you know, below a certain number, and then that gracefully decays to, 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 to Randall. So also, of course, economically, there's very unlikely that we will see you know, an industry merging like we've seen in Bitcoin or like around... Uh proof of work to, to continually try to have better chips and faster chips. Like there's just no incentive to do that here really. Exactly. Right. There's, there's very, very little incentive. So in terms of um, the incentives required for proof of work, you know, we're talking on the order of $1 billion per year that are burnt uh, by the miners and used for the security of the network. In, in the context of VDFs, you need 
almost almost no no rewards. You need on the order of a million. You know, it's nice to have a, a reward to incentivize the block proposers to include the VDFs on chain, but you don't need you don't need more than that. And so, if you have a a faster VDF, it doesn't really buy you that much. One of the things that it does buy you is that it gives you a larger so-called look ahead, meaning that you will be able to know what the random number will be slightly before everyone else. But you know, at the application layer, you need to be aware of this and, and make sure that you, you wait a sufficient amount of time. And at the consensus layer, we're also doing that. We're making sure that even if the attacker knows a little bit ahead of everyone else what the random number is, that doesn't actually affect um, the, the system in any way. Okay, okay. So it could be something like, let's say now we have a, a lottery and I'm able to calculate like slightly more, or, you know, let, I mean, I guess there, there could be some interesting use cases. Let's say you have some on-chain event, right, that's resolved by, uh, by this random number. And, you know, maybe you have some derivative market that's based on this. And now if I'm able to slightly, you know, calculate this 10 seconds earlier, then maybe I get some benefit in being able to, you know, trade on this or, or do something like that. But it doesn't really undermine the, the core. So if you take the example of a lottery, for example, um, you're going to have a point where the ticket sales have ended. So, for example, uh, for the Euro million in the UK, you know, ticket sales closes, I don't know, at, at nine o'clock or something. And then at 10 o'clock is when they actually draw the number. So there's this one hour gap between when the ticket sales close and when the draw is made. And, you know, applications will have to do a, a similar thing. They'll have to make sure that um, if someone is able to uh, know the um, the the random number er earlier than everyone else uh, by a little bit, they can't use that to, to their advantage. Okay. And, and so, yeah. So you guys are the Ethereum Foundation together with Filecoin is now funding this effort to create this open source ASIC. Can can you speak a little bit about that? Like what are some of the unique challenges around this? Right. So the number one challenge around the ASIC is uh, just the, the, the cost of it. So it it's you know, if you want to have a state of the art ASIC, um it's going to cost between fifteen and twenty million. Um and it would be nice if we could uh, split that cost across uh, multiple parties. And Filecoin is one of these parties that has uh, you know, the, the, the most interest in, in, in contributing because they would like to use a VDF uh, in, in their protocol. So it, it's a win-win if we do collaborate. At this point in time, we actually haven't made a, a go or no-go decision on spending you know, 15 to 20 million. Right now, we're still in the viability phase and we're sharing the cost 50-50 in the various studies that we're, that we're doing before taking a decision. One of the nice things is that more people are uh, interested in the VDF, so the, the, the meme is spreading in that sense. So we have uh, Solana, who is um, also potentially looking to join uh, the, uh, the so-called VDF alli uh, alliance because they're using a VDF in their protocol. Uh, we're in discussions with Tesos, so uh, we had a call with, with Arthur and they're potentially going to, uh, they, they might join the, the alliance. You know, we're, we're looking to submit a grant to the a proposal to the Tezos Foundation. Um, and then you have um, Chia that is also using a VDF in, in their protocol and they might also join the, the alliance. Chia is right now taking a slightly technically different approach. You know, they're using so-called class groups where you, we're using RSA groups you know, it's a minor technicality, and I really hope that we do converge towards the same uh, solution uh, because it would be nice if we could have the a, a kind of a cross blockchain standard for the VDF. And then you mentioned that this would be given away for free. So who, how are you going to give away these devices? Right, so we have two hardware assumptions. The first hardware assumption is that an attacker can't be much faster than the uh, the commodity hardware. And the second assumption is that there's at least one piece of hardware which is uh, controlled by an honest player, which is online. So the strategy that we're taking is to build thousands of these VDF rigs, distribute them as 
as widely as possible in the most decentralized uh, fashion possible and hope that at least one of them is going to be online at any point in time. So, you know, anyone from the VDF Alliance is more than welcome to uh, to have a, a VDF uh, rig. You know, we'll give them to enthusiasts, we'll give them to exchanges, to Ethereum, member, uh, Ethereum Foundation members, uh, we'll give them to, you know, Edward Snowden or the electric Electronic uh, um, uh, Frontier Foundation, EFF. Um, you know, we'll give them to to as many people as possible. Also, there's uh, projects that are looking to use VDFs at the application layer. So, for example, there's a, a decentralized exchange that is looking to use uh, VDFs um, to prevent front running, and so we'll we'll make sure to give them a a, a rig as well. Okay. Okay. But there's, it's not like it is something where there's maybe like a, a marginal reward to like incentivize people to keep it on and keep it running. But there's no, it's not really comparable, uh, you know, in like if something like ASIC, right, that you'd want to have, I don't know, you know, a big center where you have like many of these running or like that's, you know, that doesn't seem like something that will happen here. So one thing which may happen is that um, people who are simultaneously uh, validators in Ethereum 2.0 and VDF evaluators, so people running the hardware, um, they might have an incentive to try and slightly overclock the VDF so that they're the first one to have it and they're the first one to include the VDF output on chain and get the tiny reward. Uh, that is that is assigned to the first block proposer who includes it on chain. Maybe last thing here, and I know this is a difficult question. Uh, like, what is the timeline uh, on these things? You know, when it is, I guess, I guess some of the main milestones seem to be, you know, the launch of the beacon chain, maybe the launch of the shards. And and then having actual, I guess you said the state transfer where you can have like ETH moving over there. And on what timeline do you expect that to happen? Right. So I've said publicly in several instances that I believe uh, the beacon chain will be available in uh, 2019. Um, that's phase zero. Phase one, which is the the data layer, will come in 2020, and then the um, virtual machine will come in 2021. Um, now, just to be, give a little bit more color on this, a, a lot of the complexity has been uh, put in the in the beacon chain. So, just reaching this this initial milestone will be will be pretty huge, and I'm expecting it to happen towards the end of 2019. The data layer is very nice because there's there's almost nothing there. It's just uh, you know, blobs of data that are recorded in a hash chain. There's, there's blocks and headers. Every block is, uh, you know, uh, fixed size. There's there's very very little complexity going on. And the the fork choice rule and the the the, the mechanisms of attestations that I talked about is going to be the same as in the beacon chain. So I expect um, the data layer to come early 2020. And one of the nice things is that. With only the data layer and not the um, application layer, the, the, the state layer, you can still do useful things. So this is the what I call alternative execution engines. So if you one of the easiest examples is, is Truebit. So with Truebit, you allow people to, to make transactions, and uh, these transactions are recorded in the blockchain. And with each transaction, they're make, basically making a claim as to what the effect of that transaction is. So, for example, the transaction is compute this function. And instead of having the EVM actually compute the function, the result is, is given and there's a collateral. And then a, uh, someone, a challenger, can come in and say, hey, hold on. This is not the correct answer. The correct answer is three, not, not two. And, and then they... Um, they engage in this game where they figure out who's who's correct and who's wrong. And the nice thing about this game is that it, it happens in, in logarithmic time. So it happens very fast. Uh, and at, at little cost for the for the uh, uh, for the virtual machine. And so what you can do is that you can stuff the shards 
with you know all these transactions and execute them somewhat somewhere else. For example, in Ethereum 1.0, and this is one of the main challenges that Truebit has. Truebit is a is a wonderful system, but even just putting the data on the blockchain is extremely expensive. And so now they have this this uh, this nice option of putting the data on the shards and running the execution on on Ethereum 1.0. And then the, the, the last phase will be uh, the EVM 2.0, which is based on, on, on WASM, on, on WebAssembly. The nice thing here is that WebAssembly is becoming a, a, a standard across many, many different blockchains. So it will be well tested and it should be relatively straightforward to add WebAssembly. So that might, you know, we might also see phase two relatively soon. One of the things that um, we haven't completely figured out, for example, is the uh, sustainable storage model. How do we make sure that uh, we align the incentives in such a way that the, the state doesn't bloat and, and, and grow uncontrollably? Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Justin. That was super helpful. I feel much more clear about uh, you know what's coming for, for Ethereum. So yeah, great job and thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.